tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. And become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Oh, hello there, listeners. I'm Eric Peabody, and I see that you've managed to find your way back to Horror Hill. Now, that might not sound like such an amazing feat, but reality can be deceptive, can't it? We're always trusting our senses to communicate the truth of the world to us, but what if that wasn't always the case? What if certain elements of reality, say, something as simple as normal geometry, was fraught with hidden, indescribable peril? What if what we're seeing every day is a simple shorthand, a way for us to filter the vast chaos and madness of the universe into something more palatable. And going further, what if there are things in those rejected portions of reality? Things that can sense us and hunger for us. Tonight's episode of Horror Hill is going to be a little different than usual. It should come as no surprise to listeners of this show that I'm a fan of good old H.P. Lovecraft and of the extended mythos that his works inspired. What you might not know is that other authors had started contributing to Lovecraft's growing menagerie of monsters while he was still alive, and it was something that he actively encouraged. One of those authors is Frank Belknap Long, who was responsible for creating a particularly frightening group of creatures, even among such an esteemed rogues gallery. Tonight, we will be featuring two stories involving these creatures, these extra-dimensional nightmares that hunt humanity through space and time, these Hounds of Tindalos. First, we'll be reading Long's original story, The Hounds of Tindalos, first published in Weird Tales in 1929. In this tale, our narrator has come to the apartment of his friend, Halpin Chalmers. Chalmers tells our narrator that he has found a method to pierce the veil of space and time that keeps human perception landlocked to our surprisingly narrow island of reality. He plans to see that which humanity has never seen, but he eventually finds more than he was looking for. Of course, authors today are still writing new fiction incorporating the extended Cthulhu Mythos, or Yog sothothery as Lovecraft himself humorously referred to it. Along those lines, we're going to be pairing Long's original story with a much more modern tale involving the infamous hounds, Snack Time by Chris Lackey 
is a story that begins in the same way as many newspaper articles in Southern California, with violence on a street in Los Angeles. The difference here is that this situation does not involve gang warfare, drug violence, or anything else quite so pedestrian. This one involves a college professor, a combination Chinese restaurant slash donut shop, and a vicious creature that can bend the laws of time and space. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author Frank Belknap Long, I give you The Hounds of Tindalos. I'm glad you came, said Chalmers. He was sitting by the window, and his face was very pale. Two tall candles guttered at his elbow and cast a sickly amber light over his long nose and slightly receding chin. Chalmers would have nothing modern about his apartment. He had the soul of a medieval ascetic, and he preferred illuminated manuscripts to automobiles and leering stone gargoyles to radios and adding machines. As I crossed the room to the settee he had cleared for me, I glanced at his desk and was surprised to discover that he had been studying the mathematical formula of a celebrated contemporary physicist, and that he had covered many sheets of thin yellow paper with curious geometric designs. Einstein and John Deere, strange bedfellows, I said as my gaze wandered from his mathematical charts to the sixty or seventy quaint books that comprised his strange little library. Plotinus and Emmanuel Moscopulus, St. Thomas Aquinas and Frenically de Bessy stood elbow to elbow in the somber ebony bookcase, and chairs, table, and desk were littered with pamphlets about medieval sorcery and witchcraft and black magic and all of the valiant, glamorous things that the modern world has repudiated. Chalmers smiled engagingly and passed me a Russian cigarette on a curiously carved tray. "'We're just discovering now,' he said, "'that the old alchemists and sorcerers were two-thirds right, "'and that your modern biologist and materialist is nine-tenths wrong. "'You've always scoffed at modern science.' I said, a little impatiently. Only at scientific dogmatism, he replied. I have always been a rebel, a champion of originality and lost causes. That is why I have chosen to repudiate the conclusions of contemporary biologists. And Einstein? I asked. A priest of transcendental mathematics, he murmured reverently a profound mystic and explorer of the great suspected. Then you do not entirely despise science. Of course not, he affirmed. I merely distrust the scientific positivism of the past fifty years, the positivism of Heckel and Darwin and of Mr. Bertrand Russell. I believe that biology has failed pitifully to explain the mystery of man's origin and destiny. Give them time, I retorted. Chalmers' eyes glowed. My friend, he murmured, your pun is sublime. Give them time. That is precisely what I would do. But your modern biologist scoffs at time. He has the key, but he refuses to use it. What do we know of time, really? Einstein believes that it is relative, that it can be interpreted in terms of space, of curved space. But must we stop there? When mathematics fails us, can we not advance by insight? You are treading on dangerous ground, I replied. That is a pitfall that your true investigator avoids. That is why modern science has advanced so slowly. It accepts nothing that it cannot demonstrate. But you... 
I would take hashish, opium, all manner of drugs. I would emulate the sages of the East, and then perhaps I would apprehend... What? The fourth dimension. Theosophical rubbish. Perhaps. But I believe that drugs expand human consciousness. William James agreed with me, and I have discovered a new one. A new drug? It was used centuries ago by Chinese alchemists, but it is virtually unknown in the West. Its occult properties are amazing. With its aid, and the aid of my mathematical knowledge, I believe that I can go back through time. I do not understand... Time is merely our imperfect perception of a new dimension of space. Time and motion are both illusions. Everything that has existed from the beginning of the world exists now. Events that occurred centuries ago on this planet continue to exist in another dimension of space. Events that will occur centuries from now exist already. We cannot perceive their existence because we cannot enter the dimension of space that contains them. Human beings, as we know them, are merely fractions, infinitesimally small fractions of one enormous whole. Every human being is linked with all the life that has preceded him on this planet. All of his ancestors are parts of him. Only time separates him from his forebears, and time is an illusion and does not exist. I think I understand, I murmured. It will be sufficient for my purpose if you can form a vague idea of what I wish to achieve. I wish to strip from my eyes the veils of illusion that time has thrown over them and see the beginning and the end. And you think this new drug will help you? I'm sure that it will, and I want you to help me. I intend to take the drug immediately. I cannot wait. I must see. His eyes glittered strangely. I am going back, back through time. He rose and strode to the mantel. When he faced me again, he was holding a small square box in the palm of his hand. I have here five pellets of the drug Liao. It was used by the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, and while under its influence, he visioned Tao. Tao is the most mysterious force in the world. It surrounds and pervades all things. It contains the visible universe and everything that we call reality. He who apprehends the mysteries of Tao sees clearly all that was and will be. Rubbish, I retorted. Tao resembles a great animal, recumbent, motionless, containing in its enormous body all the worlds of our universe, the past, the present, and the future. We see portions of this great monster through a slit, which we call time. With the aid of this drug, I shall enlarge the slit. I shall behold the great figure of life, the great recumbent beast in its entirety, and what do you wish me to do? Watch, my friend. Watch and take notes. And if I go back too far, you must recall me to reality. You can recall me by shaking me violently. If I appear to be suffering acute physical pain, you must recall me at once. Chalmers, I said, I wish you wouldn't make this experiment. You're taking dreadful risks. I don't believe that there is any fourth dimension, and I emphatically do not believe in Tao, and I don't approve of your experimenting with unknown drugs. I know the properties of this drug, he replied. I know precisely how it affects the human animal, and I know its dangers. The risk does not reside in the drug itself. My only fear is that I may become lost in time. You see... I shall assist the drug. Before I swallow this pellet, I shall give my undivided attention to the geometric and algebraic symbols that I have traced on this paper. He raised the mathematical chart that rested on his knee. 
I shall prepare my mind for an excursion into time. I shall approach the fourth dimension with my conscious mind before I take the drug which will enable me to exercise occult powers of perception. Before I enter the dream world of the Eastern mystics, I shall acquire all of the mathematical help that modern science can offer. This mathematical knowledge, this conscious approach to an actual apprehension of the fourth dimension of time will supplement the work of the drug. The drug will open up stupendous new vistas. The mathematical preparation will enable me to grasp them intellectually. I have often grasped the fourth dimension in dreams, emotionally, intuitively, but I have never been able to recall in waking life the occult splendors that were momentarily revealed to me. But with your aid, I believe that I can recall them. You will take down everything that I say while I am under the influence of the drug. No matter how strange or incoherent my speech may become, you will omit nothing. When I awake, I may be able to supply the key to whatever is mysterious or incredible. I am not sure that I shall succeed, but if I do succeed... His eyes were strangely luminous. Time will exist for me no longer. He sat down abruptly. I shall make the experiment at once. Please, stand over there by the window and watch. Have you a fountain pen? I nodded gloomily and removed a pale green waterman from my upper vest pocket. And a pad, Frank? I groaned and produced a memorandum book. I emphatically disapprove of this experiment, I muttered. You're taking a frightful risk. Don't be an asinine old woman, he admonished. Nothing that you say will induce me to sob now. I entreat you to remain silent while I study these charts. He raised the charts and studied them intently. I watched the clock on the mantel as it ticked out the seconds, and a curious dread clutched at my heart so that I choked. Suddenly, the clock stopped ticking, and exactly at that moment Chalmers swallowed the drug. I rose quickly and moved towards him, but his eyes implored me not to interfere. The clock has stopped, he murmured. The forces that control it approve of my experiment. Time stopped, and I swallowed the drug. I pray God that I shall not lose my way. He closed his eyes and leaned back on the sofa. All of the blood had left his face, and he was breathing heavily. It was clear that the drug was acting with extraordinary rapidity. It is beginning to get dark, he murmured. Write that. It is beginning to get dark, and the familiar objects in the room are fading out. I can discern them vaguely through my eyelids, but they're fading swiftly. I shook my pen to make the ink come and wrote rapidly in shorthand as he continued to dictate. I am leaving the room. The walls are vanishing, and I can no longer see any of the familiar objects. Your face, though, is still visible to me. I hope that you are writing. I think that I am about to make a great leap, a leap through space. Or perhaps it is through time that I shall make the leap. I cannot tell. Everything is dark, indistinct. He sat for a while, silent, with his head sunk upon his breast. Then, suddenly, he stiffened and his eyelids fluttered open. God in heaven! he cried. I see! He was straining forward in his chair, staring at the opposite wall but I knew that he was looking beyond the wall and that the objects in the room no longer existed for him. Chalmers, I cried. Chalmers, shall I wake you? Do not, he shrieked. I see everything. All of the billions of lives that preceded me on this planet are before me at this moment. I see men of all ages, all races, all colors. They're fighting, killing, building, dancing, singing. They're sitting about rude fires on lonely gray deserts and flying through the air in monoplanes. 
They are riding the seas in bark canoes and enormous steamships. They're painting bison and mammoths on the walls of dismal caves and covering huge canvases with queer futuristic designs. I watch the migrations from Atlantis. I watch the migrations from Lemuria. I see the elder races, a strange horde of black dwarfs overwhelming Asia, and the Neanderthalers with lowered heads and bent knees ranging obscenely across Europe. I watch the Achaeans streaming into the Greek islands and the crude beginnings of Hellenic culture. I'm in Athens and Pericles is young. I'm standing on the soil of Italy. I assist in the rape of the Sabines. I march with the Imperial Legions. I tremble with awe and wonder as the enormous standards go by and the ground shakes with the tread of the victorious Hastati. A thousand naked slaves grovel before me as I pass in a litter of gold and ivory drawn by black knight oxen from Thebes, and the flower girls scream, Ave Caesar, as I nod and smile. I am myself a slave on a Moorish galley. I watch the erection of a great cathedral. Stone by stone it rises. And through months and years, I stand and watch each stone as it falls into place. I am burned on a cross, head downward in the time-scented gardens of Nero, and I watch with amusement and scorn the torturers at work in the chambers of the Inquisition. I walk in the holiest sanctuaries. I enter the temples of Venus. I kneel in adoration before the Magna Mater, and I throw coins on the bare knees of the sacred courtesans who sit with veiled faces in the groves of Babylon. I creep into an Elizabethan theater, and with the stinking rabble about me, I applaud the Merchant of Venice. I walk with Dante through the narrow streets of Florence. I meet the young Beatrice, and the hem of her garment brushes my sandals as I stare, enraptured. I am a priest of Isis, and my magic astounds the nations. Simon Magus kneels before me, imploring my assistance, and Pharaoh trembles when I approach. In India, I talk with the masters and run screaming from their presence, for their revelations are assault on wounds that bleed. I perceive everything simultaneously. I perceive everything from all sides. I am a part of all the teeming billions about me. I exist in all men, and all men exist in me. I perceive the whole of human history in a single instant, the past and the present. By simply straining, I can see farther and farther back. Now I am going back through strange curves and angles. Angles and curves multiply about me. I perceive great segments of time through curves. There is curved time and angular time. The beings that exist in angular time cannot enter curved time. It is very strange. I am going back and back. Man has disappeared from the earth. Gigantic reptiles crouch beneath enormous palms and swim through the loathly black waters of dismal lakes. Now the reptiles have disappeared. No animals remain upon the land, but beneath the waters, plainly visible to me, dark forms move slowly over the rotting vegetation. The forms are becoming simpler and simpler. Now they are single cells. All about me there are angles, strange angles that have no counterparts on the earth. I am desperately afraid. There is an abyss of being which man has never fathomed. I stared. Chalmers had risen to his feet and he was gesticulating helplessly with his arms. I am passing through unearthly angles. I am approaching... Oh, the burning horror of it! Chalmers, I cried. 
Do you wish me to interfere? He brought his right hand quickly before his face, as though to shut out a vision unspeakable. Not yet, he cried. I will go on. I will see what lies beyond. A cold sweat streamed from his forehead, and his shoulders jerked spasmodically. Beyond life, there are... His face grew ashen with terror. Things that I cannot distinguish. They move slowly through angles. They have no bodies, and they move slowly through outrageous angles. It was then that I became aware of the odor in the room. It was a pungent, indescribable odor, so nauseous that I could scarcely endure it. I stepped quickly to the window and threw it open. When I returned to Chalmers and looked into his eyes, I nearly fainted. I... I think they have scented me! He shrieked. They are slowly turning toward me! He was trembling horribly. For a moment, he clawed at the air with his hands. Then... His legs gave way beneath him and he fell forward on his face, slobbering and moaning. I watched him in silence as he dragged himself across the floor. He was no longer a man. His teeth were bared and saliva dripped from the corners of his mouth. Chalmers, I cried. Chalmers, stop it! Stop it, do you hear? As if in reply to my appeal, he commenced to utter hoarse, convulsive sounds, which resembled nothing so much as the barking of a dog, and began a sort of hideous writhing in a circle about the room. I bent and seized him by the shoulders. Violently, desperately, I shook him. He turned his head and snapped at my wrist. I was sick with horror, but I dared not release him for fear that he would destroy himself in a paroxysm of rage. Chalmers, I muttered, you must stop that. There's nothing in this room that can harm you. Do you understand? I continued to shake and admonish him, and gradually the madness died out of his face. Shivering convulsively, he crumpled into a grotesque heap on the Chinese rug. I carried him to the sofa and deposited him upon it. His features were twisted in pain and I knew that he was still struggling dumbly to escape from abominable memories. Whiskey, he muttered. You'll find a flask of it in the cabinet by the window, upper left-hand drawer. When I handed him the flask, his fingers tightened about it until the knuckles showed blue. They nearly got me, he gasped. He drained the stimulant in immoderate gulps, and gradually the color crept back into his face. That drug was the very devil, I murmured. It wasn't the drug, he moaned. His eyes no longer glared insanely, but he still wore the look of a lost soul. They scented me in time, he moaned. I went too far. What were they like, I said, to humor him. He leaned forward and gripped my arm. He was shivering horribly. No words in our language can describe them. He spoke in a hoarse whisper. They're symbolized vaguely in the myth of the fall, and in an obscene form which is occasionally found engraved on the ancient tablets. The Greeks had a name for them which veiled their essential foulness. The tree, the snake, and the apple. These are the vague symbols of a most awful mystery. His voice had risen to a scream. Frank! Frank! A terrible and unspeakable deed was done in the beginning. Before time. The deed. And from the deed. He had risen and was hysterically pacing the room. The seeds of the deed move through angles in dim recesses of time. They are hungry and athirst. Chalmers, I pleaded to quiet him. We're living in the 20th century. They are lean and athirst, he shrieked. The hounds of Tindalos. Chalmers, shall I phone for a physician? A physician cannot help me now. They are horrors of the soul, 
And yet... He hid his face in his hands and groaned. They are real, Frank. I saw them for a ghastly moment. For a moment, I stood on the other side. I stood on the pale gray shores beyond time and space, in an awful light that was not light, in a silence that shrieked. I saw them. All the evil in the universe was concentrated in their lean, hungry bodies. Or had they bodies? I saw them only for a moment. I cannot be certain, but I heard them breathe. Indescribably, for a moment I felt their breath upon my face. They turned toward me, and I fled screaming. In a single moment, I fled screaming through time. I fled down quintillions of years. But they scented me. Men awake in them, cosmic hungers. We have escaped momentarily from the foulness that rings them round. They thirst for that in us which is clean, which emerged from the deed without stain. There is a part of us which did not partake in the deed, and that they hate. But do not imagine that they are literally, prosaically evil. They are beyond good and evil as we know it. They are that which, in the beginning, fell away from cleanliness. Through the deed they became bodies of death, receptacles of all foulness. But they are not evil in our sense, because in the spheres through which they move there is no thought, no morals, no right or wrong as we understand it. There is merely the pure and the foul. The foul expresses itself through angles, the pure through curves. Man, the pure part of him, is descended from a curve. Do not laugh. I mean that literally. I rose and searched for my hat. I'm dreadfully sorry for you, Chalmers, I said as I walked towards the door. But I don't intend to stay and listen to such gibberish. I'll send my physician to see you. He's an elderly, kindly chap, and he won't be offended if you tell him to go to the devil. But I hope you'll respect his advice. A week's rest in a good sanatorium should benefit you immeasurably. I heard him laughing as I descended the stairs, but his laughter was so utterly mirthless that it moved me to tears. When Chalmers phoned the following morning, my first impulse was to hang up the receiver immediately. His request was so unusual and his voice was so wildly hysterical that I feared any further association with him would result in the impairment of my own sanity. But I could not doubt the genuineness of his misery, and when he broke down completely and I heard him sobbing over the wire, I decided to comply with his request. Very well, I said. I will come over immediately and bring the plaster. En route to Chalmers' home, I stopped at a hardware store and purchased 20 pounds of plaster of Paris. When I entered my friend's room, he was crouching by the window, watching the opposite wall out of eyes that were feverish with fright. When he saw me, he rose and seized the parcel containing the plaster with an avidity that amazed and horrified me. He had extruded all of the furniture, and the room presented a desolate appearance. It is just conceivable that we can thwart them, he exclaimed, but we must work rapidly. Frank, there's a stepladder in the hall. Bring it here immediately, and then fetch a pail of water. What for? I murmured. He turned sharply, and there was a flush on his face. To mix the plaster, you fool, he cried. To mix the plaster that will save our bodies and souls from a contamination unmentionable. To mix the plaster that will save the world from... Frank, they must be kept out. Who? I murmured. The hounds of Tindalos, he muttered. They can only reach us through angles. We must eliminate all angles from this room. I shall plaster up all of the corners, all of the crevices. 
We must make this room resemble the interior of a sphere. I knew that it would have been useless to argue with him. I fetched the stepladder, Chalmers mixed the plaster, and for three hours we labored. We filled in the four corners of the wall and the intersections of the floor and the wall and the wall and ceiling, and we rounded the sharp angles of the window seat. I shall remain in this room until they return in time, he affirmed when our task was completed. When they discover that the scent leads through curves, they will return. They will return, ravenous and snarling and unsatisfied to the foulness that was in the beginning, before time, beyond space. He nodded graciously and lit a cigarette. It was good of you to help, he said. Will you not see a physician, Chalmers? I pleaded. Perhaps tomorrow, he murmured. But now I must watch and wait. Wait for what? I urged. Chalmers smiled wanly. I know that you think me insane, he said. You have a shrewd but prosaic mind, and you cannot conceive of an entity that does not depend for its existence on force and matter. But did it ever occur to you, my friend, that force and matter are merely the barriers to perception imposed by time and space? When one knows, as I do, that time and space are identical, and that they are both deceptive because they are merely imperfect manifestations of a higher reality, one no longer seeks in the visible world for an explanation of the mystery and terror of being. I rose and walked toward the door. Forgive me, he cried. I did not mean to offend you. You have a superlative intellect, but I... I have a superhuman one. It is only natural that I should be aware of your limitations. Phone if you need me, I said, and descended the stairs two steps at a time. I'll send my physician over at once, I muttered to myself. He's a hopeless maniac, and heaven knows what'll happen if someone doesn't take charge of him immediately. The following is a condensation of two announcements which appeared in the Partridgeville Gazette for July 3, 1928. Earthquake Shakes Financial District At two o'clock this morning, an earth tremor of unusual severity broke several plate glass windows in Central Square and completely disorganized the electric and street railway systems. The tremor was felt in the outlying districts, and the steeple of the First Baptist Church on Angel Hill, designed by Christopher Wren in 1717, was entirely demolished. Firemen are now attempting to put out a blaze which threatens to destroy the Partridgeville glue works. An investigation is promised by the mayor, and an immediate attempt will be made to fix responsibility for this disastrous occurrence. A cult writer murdered by unknown guest horrible crime in Central Square. Mystery surrounds death of Halpin Chalmers. At 9 a.m. today, the body of Halpin Chalmers, author and journalist, was found in an empty room above the jewelry store of Smithwick and Isaacs, 24 Central Square. The coroner's investigation revealed that the room had been rented furnished to Mr. Chalmers on May 1st and that he had himself disposed of the furniture a fortnight ago. Chalmers was the author of several recondite books on occult themes and a member of the Bibliographic Guild. He formerly resided in Brooklyn, New York. At 7 a.m., Mr. L. E. Hancock, who occupies the apartment opposite Chalmers' room in the Smithwick and Isaacs establishment, smelt a peculiar odor when he opened his door to take in his cat in the morning edition of the Partridgeville Gazette. The odor he describes as extremely acrid and nauseous, and he affirms that he was obliged to hold his nose when he approached that section of the hall. He was about to return to his own apartment when it occurred to him that Chalmers might have accidentally forgotten to turn off the gas in his kitchenette. Becoming considerably alarmed at the thought, he decided to investigate, and when repeated tappings on Chalmers' door brought no response, he notified the superintendent. The latter opened the door by means of a pass key, and the two men quickly made their way into Chalmers' room. The room was utterly destitute of furniture, and Hancock asserts that when he first glanced at the floor, his heart went cold within him, 
and the superintendent, without saying a word, walked to the open window and stared at the building opposite for fully five minutes. Chalmers lay stretched upon his back in the center of the room. He was starkly nude and his chest and arms were covered in a peculiar bluish pus or ichor. His head lay grotesquely upon his chest. It had been completely severed from his body and the features were twisted and torn and horribly mangled. Nowhere was there a trace of blood. The room presented a most astonishing appearance. The intersections of the walls, ceiling, and floor had been thickly smeared with plaster of Paris, but at intervals fragments had cracked and fallen off, and someone had grouped these upon the floor about the murdered man so as to form a perfect triangle. Beside the body were several sheets of charred yellow paper. These bore fantastic geometric designs and symbols and several hastily scrawled sentences. The sentences were almost illegible and so absurd in context that they furnished no possible clue to the perpetrator of the crime. I am waiting and watching, Chalmers wrote. I sit by the window and watch walls and ceiling. I do not believe they can reach me, but I must be aware of the doles. Perhaps they can help them break through. The satyrs will help, and they can advance through the scarlet circles. The Greeks knew a way of preventing that. It is a great pity that we have forgotten so much. On another sheet of paper, the most badly charred of the seven or eight fragments found by Detective Sergeant Douglas of the Partridgeville Reserve was scrawled the following. Good God, the plaster is falling. A terrific shock has loosened the plaster and it is falling. An earthquake, perhaps. I never could have anticipated this. Is it growing dark in the room? I must phone Frank. But can he get here in time? I will try. I will recite the Einstein formula. I will... God, they are breaking through. They're breaking through. Smoke is pouring from the corners of the wall. Their tongues... Uh... In the opinion of Detective Sergeant Douglas, Chalmers was poisoned by some obscure chemical. He has sent specimens of the strange blue slime found on Chalmers' body to the Partridgeville Chemical Laboratories, and he expects the report will shed new light on one of the most mysterious crimes of recent years. That Chalmers entertained a guest on the evening preceding the earthquake is certain, for his neighbor distinctly heard a low murmur of conversation in the former's room as he passed it on his way to the stairs. Suspicion points to the unknown visitor, and the police are diligently endeavoring to discover his identity. Report of James Morton, Chemist and Bacteriologist My dear Mr. Douglas, The fluid sent to me for analysis is the most peculiar that I've ever examined. It resembles living protoplasm, but it lacks the peculiar substance known as enzymes. Enzymes catalyze the chemical reactions occurring in living cells, and when the cell dies, they cause it to disintegrate by hydrolyzation. Without enzymes, protoplasm should possess enduring vitality, in essence, immortality. Enzymes are the negative components, so to speak, of unicellular organism, which is the basis of all life. That living matter can exist without enzymes, biologists emphatically deny. And yet, the substance you have sent me is alive, and it lacks these quote-unquote indispensable bodies. Good God, sir! Do you realize what astounding new vistas this opens up? Excerpt from The Secret Watchers by the late Halpin Chalmers What if, parallel to the life we know, there is another life that does not die, which lacks the elements that destroy our life? Perhaps in another dimension there is a different force from that which generates our life. Perhaps this force emits energy, or something similar to energy, which passes from the unknown dimension where it is and creates a new form of cell life in our dimension. Ah, but I have seen its manifestations. I have talked with them. In my room at night I have talked with the duels, and in dreams I have seen their maker. I have stood on the dim shore beyond time and matter and seen... It. It moves through strange curves and outrageous angles. Someday I shall travel in time and meet it, 
face to face. You've been listening to The Hounds of Tindalos by Frank Belknap Long. Frank Belknap Long was a prolific American writer of horror fiction, fantasy, science fiction, poetry, gothic romance, comic books, and nonfiction. Though his writing career spanned seven decades, he is best known for his horror and science fiction short stories, including early contributions to the Cthulhu mythos. During his life, Long received the World Fantasy Award for Life Achievement at the 1978 World Fantasy Convention, the Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1987 from the Horror Writers Association, and the first Fandom Hall of Fame Award in 1977. And now, from author Chris Lackey, I present Snack Time. I was in a bit of a hurry. I was actually running for my life down an empty street in Los Angeles when I noticed a police car parked in front of a donut shop. A cop was just walking out with a bag in his arms. I ran up to him. Officer! Officer! I shouted. He was in his mid-thirties and a bit overweight. He had a mustache, which seemed to still be in fashion for police officers and firemen. His name tag read Officer Bluth. What's the problem? he asked, annoyed. I... uh... I panicked for a second. I didn't know what to say. I couldn't tell him what was really going on. That would sound crazy. My friends were... attacked. The truth. Where are they? Did you see who attacked them? Well, yeah, it... I had to softball it. It was a dog. Okay, that'll work, I thought. He looked around, worried. I knew he was buying my story. "'Where's the dog now?' he asked. "'A good question.' "'I don't know. It was chasing me. I think it might still be around.' I was sure it was. "'It's really big, like a St. Bernard, but it looks more like a Rottweiler.' I was laying it on pretty thick. Sure, it was big and doggy, but not like any dog I'd ever seen." Okay, how bad are your friends hurt? The officer asked. They were dead. I don't know, but we should get out of here, quick, I said very calmly. I always keep my head in crisis situations. I guess that's why I'm still alive. At that moment, I started to feel a little dizzy and nauseous. I could see the officer was feeling it too. Okay, let me call this, Bluth said but he was interrupted. I was looking over at the donut shop to the side of us when something moved at him. I couldn't see what happened next because warm liquid sprayed in my face and in my eyes. I heard him hit the ground as I ran blindly in the other direction. I tasted blood. I wiped my eyes as I ran and almost slammed into the donut shop's front door. It wasn't a chain store, it was one of those places that sell donuts and Chinese food. I never understood why there were so many Chinese slash donut shops in Los Angeles. Someone told me that it had to do with deep fryers, that you use the same ones for making donuts as you do egg rolls. I never checked into it. As I was saying, I was running into a fast food Chinese and donut shop covered in blood. I got inside and pushed the door shut behind me. I wiped my face a few more times, trying to get the blood out of my eyes. When I thought I could see well enough, I looked for the beast through the glass door. Nothing. All I could see was the cop's body laying on the ground about 15 feet from the squad car and 10 feet from his head. I started to panic. Oh my god! yelled someone behind me. (laughs) I swear I jumped out of my skin. Probably the worst startle of the evening. Well, one of the worst. I spun around to see a chubby, teenaged Chinese-American kid with a name tag reading Nick standing behind the counter. He took a step back. Oh yeah, I thought. I'm covered in blood and look like a lunatic. Normally, a 49-year-old, skinny, balding white guy isn't that intimidating. But when covered in blood... 
that's enough to give anyone pause. There was also a rather dirty-looking bearded man, homeless, I presumed, and a thin, older Hispanic woman wearing scrubs under a jacket. I think she was a nurse. Everyone looked terrified. Of me. Kid, call the cops, I said very calmly, though I honestly didn't know what the police could do. Maybe they had enough firepower to take the thing down, but mostly I just wanted more people around to distract it. Nick walked over to the phone without taking his eyes off me, slowly picked up the receiver and dialed 911. I thought about asking him if we could lock the door, but I didn't think it would stop the hound. I looked back outside. No sign of the beast, or of anyone. Los Angeles can be like that, a city with millions of people where, at times, the streets are totally empty. You can actually be alone on a typically busy street, and I really felt it then. I felt very alone. Are you okay? The nurse asked hesitantly. She was cautiously walking towards me. The homeless guy just sat there drinking his coffee. Yeah, it's not my blood, I said, a little too casually. Oh, she stammered as she stopped walking. Hold on, I didn't kill anybody. There's this really big rabid dog out there. It attacked that cop. I explained as I jabbed my thumb over my shoulder. Officer Bluth? Nick said, almost shouting. He ran and looked out the front doors. The whole front of the place was glass, but filled up with those poster-sized stickers with pictures of donuts and Chinese food. Oh, God, he whispered. The nurse walked over and looked out one of the windows. She gasped. I felt bad for a moment. This was my fault. If I was more careful, if I anticipated the opposition better, those fanatics... My friends and I had a plan that night. We knew there would be opposition, but we thought we could handle it. And we were wrong. They overpowered us. They had machine guns. Where did they get machine guns? And in the confusion of the gunfight, the summoned hound had no one to control it. All my friends were devoured or riddled with bullets, or both. I managed to get out with my life, but the beast seemed to be on my trail. Officer Bluth, Nick, these poor people, all affected by what I had done. Or didn't do. Then I felt the nausea again, only for a split second before it appeared. It's kind of a sickening feeling, a vertigo. Then the beast slammed into the glass and bounced off. The nurse screamed, and I felt myself just shake hard for a moment. I couldn't believe that the glass had held. Perhaps my luck was beginning to change. The thing lay on the ground, stunned. That was the first time I really got a good look at the creature. To call it a hound now seems a gross misinterpretation, but nothing else really comes close. It moved like a dog, it had four legs, a head, a mouth, and eyes, but that's where any real similarities ended. Its bone structure was different. The joints were odd and misshapen, and the skin was textured like a rotten lizard. My head throbbed as my poor brain fought with the cognitive dissonance, but I couldn't look away. They call it a Hound of Tindalos, I think. The taxonomy is sketchy on these sorts of things, so I'm still really not sure. It was still conscious, but stunned. I knew I wouldn't have an opportunity like this again, so I bolted out of the front door and towards the fallen police officer. I crouched down to unclip the holster and pull out his pistol. I spun around, ready to shoot the fallen beast with every last bullet in the gun, but it was gone. Oh no, I blew it. I kept spinning around and aiming the gun, thinking the beast was going to try to sneak up on me. I needed to move, get my back up against a wall or something, but the police car caught my attention. More specifically, the shotgun inside it. I need that, 
I thought, but it was locked into some kind of holder. I leaned over the cop's body and rummaged through his pockets while keeping an eye out for the hound. I really didn't know what the thing was capable of. I'd heard stories about the hounds of Tindalos, but it was already doing things I didn't think were possible. I thought it could only slip into our world through the angles of our universe, but it seemed to be popping up anywhere it liked. But then, why didn't it appear on the other side of the glass, the side I was actually on? I pushed the thought out of my head as I pulled out the cop's keys. I moved over to the squad car and checked the handle. It was open. I sat in the driver's seat and something poked me in the back. It was my dagger. My magic dagger. I'd forgotten I'd crammed it down the back of my pants when things went south back at the mansion. I didn't know it yet, but it was going to be very important that I had it. At that point, however, it was just a pain in my lower back. I started going through the keys, trying to find the one that would unlock the shotgun. Finally, I got the right key, grabbed the shotgun, and took some ammo. As I got out of the squad car, I tucked the pistol into my belt and ran back over to the shop. Thankfully, Nick hadn't locked me out. As I stepped inside, I saw him standing tensely behind the counter. "'Stay away!' yelled Nick, brandishing his own shotgun. Oh no, how does everyone have a gun? My god, put that thing away! screamed the nurse. Nick, calm down. I'm on your side, I said quietly and calmly. My name is David Daniels. I work at UCLA. I'm a professor. That thing is some... It's a government experiment gone awry. It just walked into nothing, he said angrily. I know he wasn't mad at me. He was mad at this thing for twisting his view of reality. When dealing with the supernatural, some people get quiet, some get angry, and some even pass out. Nick was angry. With a weapon. Not a good combination. I know, it's unsettling, but the animals... Equipped with state-of-the-art stealth technology. What, like in Star Trek? He said, with the shotgun still pointed at me. At that point, I couldn't tell if he liked Star Trek or hated it. Yeah, sure, Star Trek. But much more dangerous. Please, can you aim that thing somewhere else? I don't want you to put it down. I actually want you to shoot that damn thing if you can see it. Shoot it. Blast it and don't think twice. I have to go now, said the nurse. She began slowly walking towards the front door. I don't think that's a good idea, I said, moving to block her exit. It's still out there. I have to go home. My husband is waiting for me. I have to get him his medication. I wasn't sure how to handle the situation. I'm not really a people person, so I pointed the gun at her. Sit down! I screamed. Then she screamed at me. Then Nick was screaming. But the homeless guy didn't scream. He just looked a bit concerned. Put down the gun or I'll shoot you! Nick yelled at me. This is a life or death situation. If she goes outside, she'll die. So you're gonna kill her? I realized I might have been a bit overbearing, so I lowered my shotgun and put it on the floor. Sorry, uh, sorry, I stammered. And, as if on cue, that bend in space-time happened, but inside the shop. It was hard to focus on the hound. It was standing a few feet from me, but it looked like it was yards away. My perceptions were confused. I wasn't sure where to aim. Nick, however, seemed to have no problem. Before my eyes could even focus on it, I heard the deafening boom of his shotgun and saw the beast jerk over. It rolled across the floor and faded away. The homeless guy finally got up and moved to the back of the restaurant. He still took his coffee with him. The nurse just climbed up on top of a table and started doing this strange staccato scream. Nick started yelling, 
I couldn't tell if he was screaming in fear or for victory. I looked at him, and he was smiling, but still screaming. It was very unsettling. I got him! I got him! I got him! Ha <laughs> ha! He screamed. Nick may not have been all there, but he had some great survival instincts. It's okay. Everyone has to calm down. We're going to be okay, I said. With a crazed smile on his face, Nick shifted his gaze to me. He looked at me for a moment, unchanged. Then his face melted into an expression of confusion. The nurse got quiet. What's your name again? Nick said skeptically. David. Professor David Daniels, I said, hoping the police were going to show up soon. And why do you know so much about this? Did you make that monster? He walked out from behind the counter to me and vaguely waved his gun in my general direction. I looked over at my shotgun, still on the floor. Oh, no. No, I... I worked in another department. Even I didn't believe that one. Sure, Nick said skeptically. I was a bit worried, but I didn't think he would shoot me. I knew that if the police arrived and got us out of here, my contacts in the department could make all of those problems go away. In my side work into the world of the paranormal, I managed to bring a few police officers into the fold. Nick, I'm sorry about your friend, Officer Bluth. I lost some friends tonight too. I keep thinking about what I'm going to tell their families, about what happened. I trailed off. Nick relaxed a bit when I said this. I thought that letting Nick see a bit of my sensitive side might win him over, though I had no intention of contacting any of my associates' families. Why bother? Can I leave now? asked the nurse, still standing on the table. I think we should wait until the police arrive, but you can get down off that table, I said, with all the nicety I could muster. She gave me a dirty look and stepped down. Here it comes again, said the homeless guy. I didn't know what he was talking about until the wave of woozy hit me. The hound wasn't dead. It manifested on the counter behind Nick and leapt to a table. I noticed there was an old scar on the side of the beast where Nick had shot it. At the time, I thought it must have healed quickly, but now I realize it stepped out of time and space to heal somewhere and lick its wounds. I guess when time doesn't matter, you can wait until you're feeling better, then pick up where you left off. Amazing. I dove for my shotgun as the monster leapt from the table. Nick spun around, lifted his shotgun, and fired at the thing, but it moved too quickly. The hound jumped into Nick, knocked him to the floor, then landed on me. The hound had me pinned. I couldn't reach my shotgun, so I went for the pistol in my belt, but its hind foot trapped the gun. I saw Nick scrambling away from me, and I screamed, Help! The nurse was screaming, I couldn't see the homeless guy, and I couldn't see where Nick was off to. All I could see was the hound. It looked right into my eyes. It didn't snarl or growl. The beast just held me there for what seemed like an eternity. But in a second, the hound looked up behind me and then leapt off and over the counter. I heard a blast and felt hot gunpowder hit the top of my head and my shoulders. Nick was shooting way too close to me. My ears were ringing. I scrambled up and ran into the kitchen. The nurse followed me. Nick shot again into the dining area, then ran after me. I lost track of the homeless guy. It's gone again! What the hell? Nick screamed at me. I needed a new plan. I stood there, looking around for an idea. Nick was sliding boxes over to barricade the door. The nurse just sobbed quietly, and the homeless guy was back there already, still with his coffee. That's not going to help, I said to Nick with too much resignation. But this didn't faze him. He just kept moving boxes. I stood there, not knowing what to do. I stared for a moment at a tray full of pink frosted donuts. 
I love pink frosted donuts, I thought. I got very scared at that moment. I started to think that I would never get to eat a pink frosted donut again. So I picked one up and took a bite. I didn't think about it, I just did it. I went to a happy place. I thought about my friends, alive and laughing. I thought about my parents and sister on our family vacation riding in the back of the station wagon. I thought about when I started working at UCLA and how happy I was to be there, almost skipping across the campus to the library where the books were. The books? And then it dawned on me. I needed to do the spell. I knew how to do it. I had memorized it for crying out loud. It was relatively simple, as advanced space-time mathematical formula go. Unfortunately, it did seem like our best shot. I heard the sirens in the distance getting closer. Thank God, I thought. Something to keep it busy for a while. I needed to hurry. The hound would go through those guys in minutes. You see, at that point in my life, I had been thrust hip-deep into the world of the occult for almost ten years. It started off innocently enough when I began looking into the death of my estranged grandfather. It appears that he was an investigator of the bazaar and that he uncovered a few groups of people, one of which was called the Order of the Key. This group of almost fifty people prayed, or questioned, or looked for guidance from an ancient god called Yog sothoth When my grandfather died, he bequeathed his papers and research to me, and I became part of that world. I didn't ask for it. It just sort of happened to me. I'm a victim of life and its illusions of control. I find myself just going from point to point, connecting the dots. It's not so bad, really. Nick, do you have a marker here? I asked him. He was done with his boxes, just sitting on the floor with a shotgun across his lap. What? A magic marker. I need to do some math to figure out how uh, to shut down its cloaking technology. He had to know I was lying, but what could he do? Call me out? He just gave me a cold stare and pointed to a cabinet. I rushed over and looked inside. It had a mess of odds and ends and a few magic markers. I grabbed one and looked around in the kitchen for a space to make the circle and symbols. As I spun around looking for a suitable spot, the nurse stabbed me in the leg with a kitchen knife. This is your fault! You did this! She snarled to me through clenched teeth. I just remember thinking, you've got to be kidding me. What the hell? yelled Nick, picking up his shotgun and aiming it at the nurse. She dropped the knife and I went to the floor. She looked furious at Nick for a moment, then she realized what she had done. You could see her strength just give out, and she dropped to her knees and sobbed. As I said before, people snap and lash out in very bizarre ways. I just wish she would have stabbed herself instead of me. Because let me tell you, it hurt. What is wrong with everyone? You're all crazy! Nick was screaming and waving his gun around. I thought he was going to start shooting, infected by the madness that seemed to be filling up the place. But luckily, the police arrived. I heard the sirens pull up to the front and the back of the building. Nick moved to the service window, looking out into the dining area. I took a towel off the table near me to tie around my wound. It was fairly superficial. I stood up, keeping my eyes on the pile of sobbing nurse, and hobbled next to Nick to see what was going on. The police were already out of their squad cars with guns drawn. Bluth's corpse most likely tipped them off to the danger in the area. Hell yeah! said Nick as he moved to climb through the service window to go out to greet them. I snagged his arm. Nick, stay here. The hound is still about, I said coolly. I know, we have to warn them. He pulled his arm away from me. 
Nick climbed through the service window, put the gun down on the counter, and walked to the front doors. His hands were up in the air. The police shouted at him to get on the ground. He tried to warn them of the danger of the dog, but it was too late. One of the cops screamed. I couldn't see what was going on. The scream led to one shot, then others. Nick ran back and climbed through the service window into the kitchen. Oh, God, Nick mumbled under his breath. There's only one way to stop it. I know what we can do, I said in the most comforting way I could manage. There are more of them. I saw at least three of those things, said Nick, all hope drained away from his voice. More of them, I thought. How could that be? As far as I knew, only one had been summoned, but perhaps more had followed it. I didn't know what to do. My spell would only hold one of the creatures. There was no way that I could manage more. I had to be sure Nick wasn't mistaken. Nick, help me move these boxes. I slipped out of the kitchen door on my belly, amidst the screams and the shooting. As I scooted on the floor to the window, the shooting stopped. I was afraid to look out, but I had to. I slowly looked up to see a bloodbath. Three of the creatures were eating the fallen police. I noticed that they all had the same scar on the side of their bodies, the scar from Nick's shotgun blast. And then it dawned on me. There weren't three different creatures. It was the same hound from different points in time. These hounds of Tindalos exist outside of time and space. If it decides to go after someone or something, it can come from its own future. I really needed to do that spell. My shotgun wasn't far from where I was, and I scooted over to grab it. As I did, one of the hounds seemed to notice me. It stepped sideways and vanished. The others moved in different directions and vanished as well. That sick feeling swept over me again. Nick, they're coming! I sprung up and ran to the back, though I was sure it wasn't going to do me any good. I waved my shotgun around as I ran, anticipating the creatures to catch me unaware. Unfortunately, it was there in front of me, and it pounced. I knew I had to try to redirect the attack as best I could. It had to weigh over 200 pounds, and it didn't seem too intimidated by my gun, so I just rolled with it. As I did, I fell over onto a table and lost my shotgun. The hound rolled off the table and vanished. I heard a blast from the kitchen. Nick! I flung myself toward the kitchen, slamming through the door. Nick was standing there with brownish-pink ooze all over him and what seemed to be a dead hound. It looked skinny and frail, and it had a massive hole in the side of its chest. The nurse was lying still on the floor next to the dead hound, quietly sobbing. The homeless man now had a fresh cup of coffee and a donut. I got it, Nick said, with very little emotion. I knew this was the creature from the end of its life. It had the same scar, but it just seemed older than the others, skinny with loose skin. It came here to die, but that didn't mean it wouldn't take us as well. I had to act quickly. I ran and grabbed the marker and started making my symbols onto the kitchen floor. It was mostly a large circle with markings along the outside. I don't think this is the time, man. We just have to get out of here. Nick breathed out as he spoke. He was desperate. I wished I could just tell him that everything was going to be all right, but I knew it wouldn't. There was a banging at the back door. Open up! This is the police! Screamed a disembodied voice from outside. Nick just stood there and looked at me. I ran over and opened the door. The cop stumbled in with his pistol drawn. In the fluorescent lights, I could see he had blood on his arms. I closed the door. He looked around the kitchen at Nick and I. 
He appeared to be in his late twenties with short cropped black hair and a mustache. Gomez on his name tag. He looked around and saw the nurse crying, the quickly dissolving corpse of the hound, and the homeless guy. He looked at me and Nick. Is everyone okay? Gomez asked, though he could tell we weren't. Those things are killing everybody! What are we going to do? Nick pleaded. I've called for backup. We just need to hang tight. Do you know what's going on? My name is David Daniels. I'm a professor over at UCLA, and I think these things are part of some bioweapon the government's trying to create. They escaped. I think... I trailed off and tried to seem frightened and confused. Officer Gomez looked puzzled and horrified. Are you serious? Forget backup! Call the National Guard! I shouted. I knew we would all be dead or I would escape before anything like that happened. I just needed to buy some time with Gomez. He wasn't going to go for my spellcasting plan. Gomez talked into his shoulder CB and repeated what I said in some kind of cop lingo. As he was talking, I looked through the kitchen window, past the dining area, and out into the parking lot. There were some darkly dressed figures slowly moving towards the building. Oh no, not them, I thought. They were the cause of all this. Fanatics ruled by their insane worldview. Not jobs who will steal, threaten, or kill to get what they want. They're the reason we were in that mess. They were the reason those things were on the loose. I ducked down, hoping they didn't see me. Kid, Nick, is it? Asked Gomez. He was trying to keep Nick calm. Yeah? Mumbled Nick. I crouched there and kept quiet. Nick, it's going to be okay. We got a lot of help on the way. We've got SWAT, and if that doesn't work out, the National Guard will be here to take these things down. Nick seemed to perk up. National Guard? You can do that? Yeah, we just have to... Gomez noticed the darkly dressed people walking up to the front of the shop. As he moved to the kitchen door... A wave of distorted space-time swept over me. The kitchen door flew off its hinges with a deafening bang. I think it was a grenade. Then there was a series of gunshots. I dove behind the boxes, lay flat on the floor, and covered my ears. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew it was bedlam. A few moments later, it was quiet again, though my ears were ringing so loudly I couldn't really hear. I looked over to see Nick balled up in the corner. The nurse seemed to be hurt, but still alive, and the homeless man was just gone. I scooted on my belly to peer through the opening where the door had once been. The place was a mess. No one was left standing. Officer Gomez was pinned under the door and apparently dead. The three darkly dressed men were all in pieces. From behind the counter, a hound walked out with an arm in its mouth. I froze. I didn't breathe. I kept thinking, don't look this way. Of course it did. The hound dropped the arm and looked right at me. Again, it didn't tense up or growl or move. It just looked at me with those dark, hollow eyes. I felt like I was looking into a void that was going to suck me into it. For a moment, I thought I was going to fall from the floor. Why wouldn't it attack me? I was just laying there. Then it moved in a blur, but not at me. Back into space-time as the side of the counter exploded from a blast that came from behind me. It was Nick with that gun. My ears were ringing so loudly by then I was practically deaf. Nick said something to me, but all I saw were his lips moving. I stood up and walked over to him. Can you hear me? I screamed. He looked confused. Yes, he seemed to say. We don't have much time. I need you to stand over here by me, and I need... I, I need to do something. It'll stop these things. I promise. 
Will you help me? What? I said, will you help me? Nick looked confused. I gently grabbed him by the arm and took him to the circle I had drawn moments before. Sit down! I yelled in that monotone kind of way, like when you're trying to have a conversation in a loud bar. I began the incantation. I needed Nick, you understand. It took two people to make the spell work, and fortunately, he didn't really need to do anything but be there. I yelled the chant out, knowing it wouldn't take too long, just as long as we weren't interrupted. I was a minute into the chanting when it walked in through the kitchen doorway. The Hound. Nick raised his gun and pulled the trigger, but it only clicked. Empty. Nick started to scramble across the floor, and the hound leapt on his back and bit into his neck. Nick screamed for only a moment as his head came apart from his body. I just stood there. The thing looked at me again. Its eyes had no expression, almost like a bug's. I swear it was almost smiling at me, like it was playing. It could have easily killed me a few times over, but it didn't. Perhaps the hounds of Tyndalos are smarter than I thought, so intelligent as to have a cruel sense of humor. I still had the pistol in my belt, but I'm not very quick on the draw. Then again, what choice did I have? I figured, what the hell, and I went for the gun. I would like to tell you I performed some slick, cowboy-esque maneuver, but no, I drew the pistol with such vigor and intensity that I just threw it across the room. Very embarrassing. The hound tensed for a moment as I flailed about, trying to catch the gun. Then it relaxed and looked at me with its head slightly cocked. I laughed. It actually looked kind of cute. As I laughed, something else caught the creature's attention. I couldn't see what it saw or heard, but the hound ran back out towards the dining area and disappeared. I looked outside to see even more police had arrived. So what? The hound would still come after me through time and space. I had to do the ritual. I moved, crouching, towards the dining area to get a better look at the police. The nurse stirred on the floor. I kept low and moved over to her. Are you all right? I asked. My arm, my back, my leg. She sobbed. She had some shrapnel in her arm. I know how to stop this thing, but I need your help. Oh, God. I just need you to sit in the circle, and I'm going to say some words, and it should fix this whole problem. Will you help me? She wasn't reacting to me. She just cried and rocked. I didn't really need her to do or say anything, and at this point, I didn't care if she was willing or not. I grabbed her under her arms and dragged her to the circle. Her cries became screams as I moved her. I could see police outside moving around, and then I heard shots, and screams, and flashes. I looked away and focused on getting the nurse and myself to the circle. When we reached it, I sat her up in the center. She screamed out in pain. You have to sit up. Just sit here. I'm going to stand right behind you and say the words. We were in position. I started the chant again. I tried not to focus on the second bloodbath that was happening outside. I focused on my words and my energy. I channeled my thoughts and feelings into the circle. Time seemed to slow down. Perhaps it did. I had only a few more words to speak when the beast appeared. This time, it did not look amused. It looked furious. I knew it was going to attack, so I reached behind me and pulled out my dagger. As I said the last word, the beast charged at me, and I plunged the dagger into the nurse's chest. The hound stopped. 
It was done. I had completed the spell and the sacrifice. The hound was mine to command, and I commanded it to take me away from that time and place. And it did. I left the 21st century and went back to Paris in 1922, to my grandfather. You see, Yog sothoth had a plan for me. That's why I didn't die that night. That's why the hound didn't kill me. It was part of the plan. If those investigators in black hadn't interrupted my followers as we performed the first ritual, things wouldn't have gotten so messy. They think they're protecting humanity. They have no idea what humanity's purpose is. Not that I do, either. But Yog sothoth knows, and that's all that matters. You've just heard Snack Time by Chris Lackey. Chris Lackey is the co-host of the podcast Strange Studies of Strange Stories, formerly the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. An American filmmaker and animator, Chris directed and co-wrote the animated feature film The Chosen One and was the associate producer of the films The Call of Cthulhu and The Whisperer in the Darkness. He co-wrote the graphic novel Deadbeats and adapted The Temple for Self-Made Heroes Lovecraft Anthology Volume 2. Chris lives and works in Yorkshire, England. Well, folks, that wraps up our brief detour into the Cthulhu mythos. We very well might return here in a future episode, but for now, I'm just glad that we got to have some kind-hearted stories involving man's best friend. I'd like to thank Chris Lackey and, belatedly, Frank Belknap Long for tonight's stories. Next week, we'll be returning to our more usual fare, and I expect to see you back here on Horror Hill to join me. Until then, listeners, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's dark tales, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.
chilling tales for dark nights.